Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so, we have the five pillars of Islam. The mandatory acts that make up the fundamental core of your Muslim identity. There is no way I can do justice to the depth and beauty behind each pillar, but for the sake of time, I can at least introduce them. I will begin with salah, or prayer. Let's say you want a job, and you have lots of interviews. When you get a job interview, I am certain that you're going to make sure to revolve your whole day around it. You're not hanging out with people during that time, you don't have any invasive plans, you show up on time, and you're making sure that you don't mess up that interview. Effectively, you revolve your whole schedule around the interview so that you are reminded of how important the job is. Now with salah or prayer, it works very similarly. We have these regular meetings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we revolve our schedules around the respective prayer times because our scheduled prayer times will remind us about how important our most important meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the Day of Judgment. Now, when did prayer become mandatory for Muslims? What is the origin story of prayer? I want to talk about the Year of Sadness. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was preaching Islam in the early years, his people were so threatened and enraged at the message he brought because it interrupted their power dynamic and status quo, that there was an embargo on the Muslims. Not all of the Quraysh or his tribe were against the Prophet وسلم, but they weren't allowed to give any food to them no marriage with them, nor could they have any business interactions with them. And if they did, the prices had to be marked up to ridiculous numbers. And all of this would end immediately under one condition, if they hand over the Prophet wasallam. This was a weird form of ethnic cleansing. People were so hungry, subhanAllah, that they would eat tree bark. And it was said that there was a 30-day span where the Prophet wasallam and Bilal radiallahu an didn't eat. Abu Talib, the Prophet wasallam's uncle and protector, couldn't even help. And it was at that point Abu Talib passed away without accepting Islam. Abu Talib was like a beloved father to the Prophet ﷺ. He gave him protection. The Prophet ﷺ loved him dearly. So much so that Abu Bakr, the best friend of the Prophet ﷺ, his father Abu Kuhafa embraced Islam after 21 years of the message. The death of Abu Talib affected the Prophet ﷺ so much that when his own father accepted Islam, Abu Bakr wished that it was Abu Talib instead. And at that point, after two years of the embargo, Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, ending the Prophet ﷺ's and hers 25-year beautiful marriage. She was the pillar supporting the Prophet ﷺ during his darkest times. Now, the Prophet ﷺ was so affected by this, he couldn't even come out of his home. He wouldn't even smile. So now, the Prophet ﷺ lost his support inside and outside the home. And then it was at that point that the Quraysh closed their door to the message. So the Prophet ﷺ took his foster son Zayd an, to Ta'if, the town, without a mount, without food, so the Quraysh wouldn't find him. They hiked 60 miles in the scalding desert with no food, no mount, no provisions. SubhanAllah. How many people today, with all the food in the world, a gallon of water and all this stuff, wouldn't do a 20 mile hike in nice, cool, little crispy conditions? So once the Prophet ﷺ made it to Ta'if, he was preaching the message for 10 to 15 days, and it was at that point that they got sick of him and they attempted to kill him and his foster son Zayd an, so they chased him for two miles, two miles, pelting stones at him. Can you imagine, subhanAllah, not a 200 meter sprint, not a 400 meter dash, not a 1000 meter dash, two miles. Can you imagine sprinting for that long in the hot desert? It was at this point that the Prophet wasallam was caked in blood, so much so that his sandal wouldn't, wouldn't be removed from his foot. And his foster son Zayd cracked his skull. And it was at this moment that the Prophet wasallam was at the lowest of his low. He had nowhere else to turn. And it was at that point, the night journey happened which I can't go over for the sake of time right now. But just know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to such a special place that even Archangel Jibreel alayhi salam never went there. And he was given the gift of salah at that point. And after then, the five-time daily salah was ordained. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was at the worst point in his life, Allah brought the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam close to him and gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a gift. Note how I said gift. It's a gift because when we are at the lowest of our lows, when we have nowhere else to turn, when life seems to be caving in on us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a special, intimate connection with Him that He has not gifted any non-believer. And it is with this beautiful salah. Why is it that you'll find self-help gurus and serial entrepreneurs always advocating for morning routines and meditating? They're trying to emulate or copy what we have with our salah. And we have this right in front of us, but subhanAllah, we take it for granted. Now, fast forward. Omar, radiallahu anh, one of the best friends of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was the leader of the Muslims at this time. He was assassinated. He was stabbed in the abdomen. The cut was so severe that his innards and intestines would slip outside of the wound. He was losing so much blood and in so much pain that he would constantly slip in and out of consciousness, subhanAllah. But then 
when he would regain consciousness, the first thing he would say, have the people prayed, the Salah, the Salah. He would then push his innards back in, make wudu, purify himself, and pray, and then slip out of consciousness again. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and establish the prayer for my remembrance. We pray to remember Allah, but this isn't meant to be seen as a bane or something in the way. We need this special intimate connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than we could ever know, not just in this life, but the next. Next, we have zakat, the mandatory charity. What's interesting is that while this is for the betterment of the ummah, we need this just as much as the impoverished people need help. What do I mean? There is a sense of gratitude that comes with charity. The Prophet ﷺ said that with matters relating to the dunya, look to those who have less than you. But regarding matters of the akhirah, the afterlife, look to those better than you. Why is this? Because reminding yourself that you have it better than a lot of people, shoot, the vast majority of the world instills a sense of humility and thankfulness in you. Huffington Post even states that the key to happiness isn't money, it's not clothes, it's not a spouse, it's gratitude. There are many studies about it. I remember watching this video of a social experiment where all they simply did was make somebody, call somebody that they love and just say, I love you and thank you. These people were calling people that they haven't spoken to in years or they hadn't even told I love you in years like their parents or something like that and they were in tears. People had no idea the effect that it would have simply saying I love you and thank you to somebody. I can bet that none of you remember the meal that you ate for lunch two weeks ago, but you remember the smile of a homeless person that you fed two years ago. There's a Harvard Business School study that suggests that donating to others is directly correlated with an increased sense of happiness. The Harvard researchers write, and I quote, happier people give more and giving makes people happier, such that happiness and giving may operate in a positive feedback loop. Next, zakat saves the world. Poverty is a problem that has proven solutions. And by giving, it plays a crucial role in combating this extreme poverty. And if nothing else, sadaqah and zakat have supernatural effects on your risk and qadr and all of the things that come into your life. I'm sure that you've heard in times of calamity, one of the first pieces of advice that you'll get as a Muslim is that you should perhaps maybe give a little bit of sadaqah, just a couple of bucks to receive blessings. Giving sadaqah responsibly, of course, is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed he will repay you not only in this life, but the next life as well. There is a hadith that says that there will be no one who loses their wealth by giving in charity. Who knows how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pay you back? It's almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has programmed us to be altruistic, good people. And if we were, the world would be saved. Who would have thought? <laughs> now, in Western culture, I'm sure you've heard about how in weddings, there are rehearsal dinners before they have the big reception. When the toast is, where people should be, and what time certain performances happen. Hold on to that thought. Let's take a look at the pilgrimage. Men wear a garment called the ihram, which is a simple two-piece white garment that we tie around ourselves. And similarly, when we die, we wear a simple white wrapping. I know a brother who went on Hajj the same year as the king of Mali, and no one would have been able to tell. Why is this so profound? Because no one cares who you were on the Day of Judgment. No one cares if you drove a Beamer or you make a lot of money or made a lot of money. Because on the Day of Judgment, we're all going to be equal. The only thing separating us is going to be our deeds. And this manifests itself in every part of Hajj. There's even a part that's so beautiful called Muzdalifa, where you must sleep with nothing else other than the clothes on your back under the desert stars. You are forced to experience life with such a skeletal, basic lens. Next, during the Hajj, we circumambulate and walk around the Kaaba. Now, interestingly, from the tiniest form of existence, an atom, to tornadoes and hurricanes and the passing of days, the rotation of galaxies at every level of existence, you find cycles. What is the significance of this? It's symbolic. What begins will return right back to where it came from. The term yom in Arabic is used for day, but its real translation is cycle. There's a prayer that we read at Islamic burials. We came from dust, we return to dust, and we will be made again on the day of resurrection. This is all one big cycle. Now remember what I mentioned about the wedding? Hajj is the rehearsal dinner for our deaths. Next. Fasting the month of Ramadan. Now let's start with the obvious. Healthline has stated that fasting promotes blood sugar control by reducing insulin resistance, enhancing heart health by improving blood pressure and cholesterol levels. It's found that it may boost brain function and prevent neurodegenerative disorders, aids weight loss by limiting calorie intake and boosting metabolism, increases weight loss and muscle strength, and could delay aging and extend longevity, may aid in cancer prevention, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just ordain this upon us to suffer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Hakim, the most wise. There is a wisdom behind everything. But even beyond physical benefits, fasting helps us in other ways as well. Severe addiction to food is something we don't actually realize we have until we don't have it for just a bit. We get angry, irritable, we lash out, act differently. The Quran says fasting has been prescribed for you perhaps so that you become righteous. It teaches you discipline. 
people always look up to the next level of commitment and always gawk about how crazy it is. For example, we gawk about how crazy it is that Gandhi went on a 40-day hunger strike, but he did it. Much like how people freak out that we go through Ramadan, but we're chill about it. It's just a matter of mental configuration and trusting the process. You begin to notice that the more that you fast, the easier it becomes. Fasting teaches you mindset. The primary barrier separating us from Gandhi is the mental and spiritual conditioning. And Islam serves to give us the tools to earn that honor and strength above the rest. How can we prove that we have the mental strength to stop ourselves from doing wrong or sinning? Ramadan can serve as a mental boot camp or a mental gym in that sort of way. People will always look at you and exclaim how that's impossible for them. But for you, it's chill. Otherwise, there are a whole underbelly of benefits that will leak into other parts of your life that is for those who do it with the right intentions. And so, lastly, we have the Shahada. This is it, testifying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one true God and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger. This is what separates us from heedlessness. This obviously, when ordering things, should have gone first, but I'm not really going to explain much more because the more you research into Islam, the more you understand at least a little bit, why Islam is true, not only from a tangible, physical standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint as well. Islam is the order to all of our discord. With that, I conclude this long series. I pray that it was of some benefit to you, that you have a more profound understanding of what Muslims believe in and why, because Alhamdulillah, this was very beneficial for me. I end by praying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us and He keeps our hearts firm on the correct path. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Thank you for following me on this series. Jazakum Allahu khayran. Barakallahu feekum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa la'asr. Inna al-insana la fi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Assalamu alaikum.